everyone. Welcome to Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast. This podcast is all about farmer's markets, how to increase your market business success, and in our current climate, maximize safety while providing people with fresh food. Farmer's markets are essential. Whether you're a farmer's market manager or a small farmer or food maker selling at farmer's markets, you have found just the right podcast. This week, we're featuring a Best of Tent Talk episode, revisiting our conversation with agricultural anthropologist Dr. Gail Myers. For more than two decades, Dr. Myers has been advocating for African-American farmers by lecturing, researching, teaching, and writing. Fifteen years ago, she co-founded Farms to Grow, Inc. to help educate and develop new farmers, since today, less than 10% of the African-American farmers from 1920 are still on the land. Dr. Myers and her team are currently wrapping up post-production on a multimedia documentary that explores the history of black farmers in the United States. Support those efforts during Black History Month by visiting rhythmsoftheland.com and donating to that project. We'll be addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion at Farmers Markets at Intense, the Farmers Market Conference 2021, live online March 15th through 18th. In the meantime, listen in as we chat with Dr. Myers about the inspiration for farms to grow and what it takes to run a community farmers market with a mission. Okay, so um, Gail, can you uh, you start just by telling us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in agriculture and farming? It's almost, you know, I often think it's so by chance. I grew up in Daytona Beach, Florida, and went to the beach every day. So growing up, I had no idea that I would be working in the food system or in the food world or with farmers. I intended to... Um, stay in the academy. Actually, I'd gone through several universities, as you can see in my background. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I was intent on doing some field work and possibly some teaching here and there and just living a pretty decent academic life. And my first semester at um, Ohio State, which I went to, I'm a cultural anthropologist. I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist. And so uh, the first week there, I talked to my advisor about his work with farmers And the topic of black farmers came up. I left the office uh, because I didn't know anything. This was in 1997. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm I'm somewhat embarrassed, the only African-American person in the program. And I thought to myself, the next time that question comes up, I need to have a better answer than, you know, I don't know. (laughs) So left his office, went to the library, and it was in 97, in the beginning of the Pigford versus Glickman um, a litigation where class action suit uh, about 12,000 farmers sued the USDA for discrimination. And I was quite curious. And as I began to sort of call the literature, which was very little, I couldn't find anything on black farmers other than this litigation stuff. So uh, initially I got involved just as a sort of concerned citizen Uh, And certainly as an African-American, someone who was concerned about my farming history and and the heritage of our people and started interviewing farmers and historians. And a friend of mine had a sister that worked for the USDA. And I mentioned to her that I was going to Georgia to do my field work, which I had some friends there that had farmers in their family. And I would start there. And she said, why are you going to Georgia when we've got black farmers here in Ohio? And I said, no way. (laughs) So that led to an interview with a historian and eventually uh, interviews with over 100 farmers. And then, um, you know, it was very clear after began collecting all this data and my heart just became so full of, you know, compassion, impassioned and, and just concern about what was happening to them. The stories I heard in the interview, uh, it was clear to me that I would not be going to Ecuador. So five years later, ended up writing a dissertation on the uh, sustainable farming practices and adaptations of African-American farmers in Ohio. And the year before I graduated, I also, with uh, co-sponsorship from Ohio State University, Central State, Glory Foods, Kenyon College, and a couple of other entities organized a statewide farmers statewide conference uh, for black farmers called uh, Black Farmers at the Crossroads. And it was really important to me that I do something for um, all this knowledge and learning that I was getting at Ohio State and this very pristine universities. 
it just didn't feel the right thing for me to do, the kind of person that I am to graduate and go on with my life. So as time, you know, uh, upon graduation and my colleagues were considering and interviewing for jobs at universities and archaeological um, institutes, uh, they asked me, they said, Gil, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know, but I got farms to grow. <laughs> and it just came off of my tongue because I saw as I was traveling throughout the state for three and a half years, um, working on my dissertation and just doing field work, that there was such a need. And it just felt like I, that I don't even, how dare I learn about all the trials and, and the traumas that these people have dealt with and just go away with this data. So upon, uh, I went back to Georgia, which is where I got done my master's work and thought, oh, I'd get on with some entity there and start working and doing just, I didn't know what I was going to do, but just doing something. And I got back to Georgia in 2002 and started throwing around the term agroecology, which was the framework that I was looking at my work in sustainable ag, which is how I saw the African-American farmers practices fitting into the, to the, the, the studies what I had been uh, covered in, in Ohio State. And I dropped those two terms and no one understood. And we're like, well, what is agroecology? Oh, yeah, what's that other one, sustainable ag? We had heard about that. And I thought, oh, my goodness, <laughs> it's going to be some hard work. Um, couple of, I did some teaching at Morehouse College. And about two months into my teaching, a colleague of mine had moved to San Francisco. And she says, Gail, I got this short-term assignment over the holidays. I need someone with your expertise. I'm, I'm pretty good with inventory and math. It was just a little side gig. And she said, come on and, and I'll get your ticket, pay you well. So I went to San Francisco. So I started asking people, hey, do you know anything about agroecology and sustainable agriculture? Guess what happened? I didn't have to like explain the terms. So after that assignment, it felt so comfortable, like I was where I should be doing this work. Um, although it wasn't where many African-American farmers were farming at the time, I, you know, w ended up in San Francisco initially and then moved to Oakland. And as soon as I got there, I started interviewing farmers through a short-term consult and found out that the farmers in California were, it was like I had saved the recordings of the interviews from the farmers in Ohio and I did some pilot studies in Georgia they were dealing with the same issues, not having access to market, being ignored, uh, being disenfranchised, and, and really outright uh, being intimidated and harassed in, in, in trying to farm. And so here I am now with all this information, and I remember a call with my co-founder, Gordon Reed. He's in Cincinnati, who I met as part of doing my research. And I said, Gordon, this is so, it's, 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 it's really sad that the farmers are still dealing with the same thing I heard during my dissertation. He said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I, I, what about that Farms to Grow thing? So we started Farms to Grow in uh, 2004. And um, again, it was like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but we got to do something. And so that, the foundation, that, that nonprofit, another thing I had no idea I'd be doing, working at a nonprofit, I've been working you know, in uh, colleges and universities and, you know, very strict deadlines and timelines and benchmarks and those kinds of things, writing reports. And this work was really different in the field. Um, and the first thing, how we ended up really getting involved in this farmer's market management and development was that I was asked to uh, start manage the Bayview Hunters Point Farmer's Market in 2005. So I was hired by Pacific Coast Farmer's Market Association they didn't have a black farmer's market manager. It was a predominantly black community, so they trained me. And I did that for three years as a manager. For the fourth year, our organization, Farms to Grow, actually took it over because uh, Pacific Coast was no longer interested. And in the fifth year, we I trained the other community. And in the fifth year, we basically provided technical assistance because it was very important for me. I, at that point, I had moved to Oakland. Initially, I was in San Francisco that the, the brain, the, the knowledge of doing this stay in the community. So I insisted on the, the organization that was co-sponsoring, I need someone that lives in your neighborhood, lives in this community that I can train how to do this stuff. And so I worked with um, uh, this organization, trained a new manager, and throughout the course of that, this is really tell, telling you, let me know if it's, this is taking too long, the progression of our work, as I'm in Bayview Hunters Point, opening this farmer's market, 
young kids were coming up when it was on a Saturday, looking, coming to the market and pointing to the fruit. They say, what's that? I said, that's a peach. So what's that? It's a plum. It's breaking my heart. These kids had never seen fresh fruits. So I thought, here again, what do we do? So we started a Gardens to Grow program in Bayview, and we put in three gardens, one in a daycare, one in an elementary school, and one in an after-school program. So we trained children, youth, parents, teachers, community members, volunteers, how to implement their own gardens. So we did the Gardens to Grow program out of just the sheer need of seeing uh, community members not recognizing these fresh fruit, not having any familiarity with them. And then parents, you know, as we brought the food to the market, parents not knowing what to do with it. So we did a cooking program, a nutrition program as part of that. And so for five years, we worked at the Charles Drew Elementary School teaching third grade girls and eventually the last two years we worked with boys because they're like, how come the girls get to cook and we don't? <laughs> Good. <laughs> For an hour on a, every Thursday beginning in January um, because that's what the time that they had a free, pla- free period from 12 to 1 every Thursday. And the principal asked us. So most of the work that we've done, we've been invited to do. And um, so, yeah, that's – and then, you know, the rest is somewhat is history. We – began to work uh, closely with other farmers as I got into the state and learned who they were and what their work was and what their needs were, more or less. And, and so eventually um, we started the Freedom Farmers Market in 2013, again, out of a need. Uh, there was a restaurant owner uh, who had a uh, restaurant called Brother's Kitchen, and he opened the restaurant. I met Ken in 2013, but in 2012 he opened the restaurant, and he said, on his menu, you'll see it coming soon, Black Farmer's Market. I had no I didn't know him in 2012. So one of my mentors um, connected me with Ken in 2013. And he says, I, I understand that you're connected with farmers. And uh, at that time, we had been really connected, going, taking volunteers out to farmers and, you know, helping them write grants, um, agritourism programs. We had uh, like farmer lecture series where we're bringing farmers into the schools to talk to young people. And so it was uh, the next step us for us really in, in doing something concrete for these farmers and for the community. So we surveyed the community. We went to the African American Farms Association, Fresno, surveyed them, and they said, let's do it. Well, first of all, this work built on the Mo Better Foods Farmers Market that was in Oakland in 90. Started, I think, in 98, 99, when I was still a student at Ohio State. The work of David Roach and other folks with the um, West Oakland Food Initiative. So they had that farmer's market for some time near the West Oakland BART. And it had ended for a few years. And the main farmer, Mr. Will Scott, had been coming into Oakland. So we had a relationship with Oakland. Folks had a relationship with him. So this was the next step. Mr. Scott and several farmers came to Oakland. They saw the location. And the reason we wanted to do it in West Oakland is because when you look at the, the rates of food apartheid and meaning where grocery stores are not uh, because of the policies of city uh, leaders, and you look at the disparities in health, disparities in crime, disparities in everything you want to know, uh, they were in that community. And we wanted to put something that, had, that gave hope, that brought life and nourishment and it was a familiar face we had hoped uh, for the community members. So we started the farmer's market. And, and another reason is that we had a farmer who had indicated to us that he was given an 18-month waiting list to get into a farmer, uh, one of the mainstream farmer's markets. We thought, that's, a, that's crazy. So we farms, the Freedom Farmer's Market was an answer to a lot of things. It was an answer for a community that was going without fresh food. Uh, the, answer is for, the answer for some farmers that didn't have access to other farmers' markets. So if we weren't getting a seat at the table, we just made our own table. So <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Did you end up with farmers coming over from other farmers' markets and joining you? No. We, we did recruit uh, because I have colleagues in, very, in the, the Richmond Farmers' Market and a couple of other farmers' markets I, I was recruiting um, other vendors, like I recruited uh, an Asian egg vendor 
and uh, a Latinx uh, strawberry vendor. And they came up for a couple of Saturdays, but because of the foot traffic that they didn't see, they weren't able to sustain. You know, as a small farmer, there's a margin that you just got to keep. And if it doesn't happen, you've got costs, transportation. Yeah, that was one of our questions here is um, because our program is dedicated to making sure that farmers can make a living and keep farming because they're financially sustainable. A lot of times it's a challenge for them to go into a market that's in a smaller community or in a community that has less disposable income. So did your farmers end up making money at the Freedom Farmers Market? Were they able to sustain themselves? They sustained themselves um, and it certainly was without weeks of disappointment. But we also had weeks where there were large crowds. I think the difference in the farmers that we see in our market is that they're coming there. Yes, they're coming to make a profit and they have to. But they're coming more to sort of answer a historical um, uh, an exchange. It's an engagement piece that for many of these farmers that could take their produce at some other markets, they were more interested in really being a part of a community that was needing them, you know, that needed what they had. Um, We have uh, Ron Kelly, who's in Sacramento, Ron R. Kelly Farms, and he grows the best purple hull peas and Crowder peas and and black eyed peas. And those are the the peas that uh, when Africans were kidnapped and brought into this country, the women braided them in their hair. So those peas have such a history and they're still grown in California by uh, many of our African-American farmers. We know that if it wasn't for African-American farmers growing that food, we wouldn't have access to it. So they're coming to really answer a need for a lot of people that don't have, some do, but for a new generation that don't have a historical context. So these farmers are coming for a celebration of themselves. Um, And yes, they definitely need to make a profit and they do well enough to keep coming. Does it give them any credibility too, to get into larger markets that they've done your market for a certain period of time? Then can they go back and approach ferry building or somewhere that has, you know, maybe a a larger audience that they can serve and make some money on one day and support history on another. Yes. Uh, And many of them have been involved. Most of them are involved in several markets. Uh, Kelly, he's in Sacramento. He's involved in several markets there. Mr. Scott, as in addition to being on site, all, is also a drop off for a couple of other markets. And there um, have been uh, attempts, I think, at, at the Richmond Farmers Market. And uh, but it, but there's something to say. I don't know if you've I don't know if you've been to our market. I haven't been to the Freedom it's, Market. I've been to Richmond. It's, it's a whole different vibration, if you will. And I think for people who are stewards of the land and yes, they got to make a profit. And they're, you know, part of that is that Mr. Scott, for example, he's retired from another venture. So he gets another source of income. Uh, many of the other farmers maybe work full time or work part time. And so they have other, other opportunities for revenue, but they love what happens at the market. They know that there's something that people are getting at this market that they may not be um, engaged in at other markets. And so they come and they stay for that. I'm surprised every year when, you know, we got a young farmer, uh, raised roots, uh, Jamil. um, He was our first market. And I knew, I said, well, man, look at his, all of his products are amazing. Um, And he doesn't grow the traditional um, like peas, you know, he grows, you know, many of the things that you find in mainstream markets. And his prices are a little bit higher than the other farmers. I said, we probably got him for another year. And he calls like, I'm ready, ready to come back this year. <laughs> um, and he, keep, he keeps coming back. And I think what I know that happens for him is that he sees this market as part of a movement, as part of a movement that he could really put his fingerprint on to say, I contributed to that. I contributed to building a community where we have a community Uh, experience. So it's a gathering, it's a farmer's market, but it's also a cultural gathering place place to celebrate what otherwise is a very negative narrative around African-Americans and food and land. Uh, Many African-Americans don't want to be involved in land because of the history of the enslavement period. But what, what, what we're doing is turning that negative narrative into something very positive and enriching 
and like almost necessary. People come, as a matter of fact, what we've done with the, with the Purple Hole Peas and Crowder Peas, when the elders come, they've come as far as San Francisco because we had some radio ads when we first opened telling people about the Crowder Peas. And they said, I heard your ad on the radio. I came right over. I haven't had Crowder Peas in 20 years since I left Mississippi or I haven't, you know, had this kind of yellow seed watermelon or something. And these are people who had never been to a farmer's market. They said, I, I don't go to farmer's markets. They don't have anything for me. They come, they bring their neighbors. And, you know, people have come from Sacramento, but now they're black farmers in Sacramento because of the experience. We have the watermelon eating contest, the crowded pea shelling contest, uh, the sweet potato tasting contest. We have something called budding poets. Like every month we have something where the community, it's very grassroots, where the community can actually come, um, touch the farmers, talk to the farmers, contribute to the development of this market. And I've heard people say who are, have come to the market, this is in its sixth year now, although we've handed it over to uh, another church, another organization, that they say, this is my medicine. This is what I need every week to come here. Um, and we get burly, big black guys that come and say, man, we need this in all of Oakland. He says, I and they come through those doors and the gates. He says, I feel so safe here. So we are creating an, an experience. It's, it's Yes, it's shopping for fresh food, but it's also shopping for a part of your cultural identity that is so missing in a community that is shamed because of a relationship with land or shamed for eating watermelon. You know, I have folks who won't eat watermelon because of the negative stereotypes that have been associated with. But we will have a watermelon eating contest and reclaim that narrative. So it's about reclaiming our history. And in doing so for us, you know, as an organization, our mission is to grow farmers. So, you know, if we can get 1% of the folks that come to say, you know, I want to be a farmer, and that's what we've been doing. We've been getting young guys to come, and they'll just sit next to Mr. Scott, who's our elder farmer, and they go, I want to farm, and they ask him questions. He would otherwise not be accessible, or they would otherwise not feel comfortable possibly going to other farmers markets to even engage him. So we're creating a safe space a cultural space and a place for memory. We get the, the women who come in and they go, I, inevitably they'll exchange a recipe about how you cooking your peas or how you cooking your okra, how you cooking your greens. It takes them back to a, a place in their childhood. It takes them back to a very positive memory. It feels like most of them are speaking of things that are a very positive expression of who they are that sometimes get lost. You know, when you move around in a big world and it's all about money and it's all about, you know, just going to the grocery store and get something that you're not connected to. We're creating an experience where people can connect to the food and possibly connect back to the land. So, I, you know, when we opened the market, it was really all about finding a place for black farmers to sell their food and finding a place for community, uh, you know, lower wealth communities to access foods that were familiar to them. Because you can have a farmer's market and you can have food that they like. But when you have food that's culturally accessible, that's cultural access to food. And that doesn't also, that doesn't always happen in, in other markets. So we were creating this space and we did, we had no idea that it would be transformative for so many people in the community. And um, yes, um, I'll stop there. <laughs> Dr. Gale, do you see a big enough population of farmers, African-American farmers, and also a big enough, I think there's a big audience. Um, yes, do you, yes. Do you see the possibility of expanding this when the, the band comes in you and know, says this should be all over Oakland? Do you no, see getting into other parts of Oakland, no, other parts of the state and the country? See, we don't see a large population of African-American farmers that are equipped to, to farm. We have a farmer's market training program for, you see, this program got off the ground in 2015 where we've trained 40 farmers throughout the state of California, from Fresno to Sacramento to Oakland, to be ready to sell in a farmer's market. And inevitably, we've, they've come because they have land, but they're working full time, waiting for retirement, got to make cons changes on the barn or changes on the house. They don't have a truck. They don't have the wherewithal to get up every Saturday and come to our farmer's market. We don't see, except for in the urban communities growing new farmers. So yeah, we don't see more black farmers coming on board. We are working with our current farmers, which we have uh, six or set, six, six that we work with pretty much full-time all the time. 
There are three others that have been loosely connected. They've come a couple of times. They weren't able to pay a laborer. They have issues on their farm. And so for black farmers, the just life daily issues of land tenure, making sure that their land is secure, making sure that they have everything that they need to uh, grow. They, those things aren't in place uh, like, you know, for other farmers. And so, you know, the projection about growing new farmers, we're just really hoping to and working to sustain the farmers that we have. Yeah. And that's and, a challenge for all farm populations, yeah. actually. But yes, absolutely. Do you see this kind of program back in Ohio where there's a lot of farmers? Are you seeing farmers markets centered on the African American community no. in other parts of the country? No. We are. We uh, There's uh, a, a, a farmers market in the Georgia area. And there's some smaller uh, one in North Carolina. But many of these markets are part of other sort of larger markets, some of them maybe monthly. And we really stepped out on, on we initially we wanted to be uh, a year round, but we, we had to, you know, roll that back and become seasonal. So our market went from June, July to November. Because the year that we thought we'd go year round, we thought after Thanksgiving folks would come, the, the folks stopped coming after Thanksgiving. And the farmers had you know, less produce, so we said it's going to be best for the farmers. Really, we made that, that decision that best for the farmers to be seasonal. But, um, yeah, there's, there's a, I think there's a lot more demand than there is supply of farmers and their food. And so, you know, we love to figure out how to grow more farmers by giving and, and assisting them in getting all the infrastructure needs that they have to be able to come to our market. Um, but so what we do with the, the six farmers that we work with primarily is in addition to um, the farmer's market. So during the off season, we're working on getting their product into restaurants and um, schools and other catering opportunities so that they have a, a year round uh, market. And that way they can, you know, con- continue to sustain themselves. And then a lot of these, I think for Mr. Scott, and especially Ron Kelly, I think they're just, they just see the work, the vision that we, we are holding for our community. And um, they want to hold it with us, you know, because it's, it's a rare story. And so um, our board works in Ohio and we know farmers there in Ohio. And the, um, again, I, I, I feel like they're up against, I haven't spoken to any of the farmers lately, but From my experience, they'd be up against some of the same things, working full time during the week. They don't necessarily have Friday evening uh, or Saturday morning to just come to the market, you know. And um, but we're working on very creative ways to get them into markets like um, hiring young people or adults to actually sell the produce for them. They will harvest it with their labor and then we'll provide the, the transportation to get their stuff here to the market because we've got to be very creative around helping them um, sustain themselves. So the traditional, you know, the family gets together on Thursday or Friday. If you have a market on Friday or, you know, if you have one on Saturday, uh, Friday night to get the produce ready, put it in the cooler, pack the truck, get ready. Um, a lot of farmers just don't have, they don't have the, the labor that they can afford to pay. Um, the, all of the materials that it costs, the gas, the time, it's a commitment to do this seasonal. And we've worked with farmers, uh, several um, Asian farmers throughout California that we've invited, a couple of other Latinx farmers that we've invited. And they want to hold the vision for us, too. But, you know, they're like, it's, it's, not, a, it's a, not a market that I, can, that I can sustain. And so we understand that, you know, and it's a challenge. I think the, the vision that we have and the work that we're doing with the Freedom Farmers Market is 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 notable. You know, it's noble, and and we would love to have hundreds of people to come to that market every every week. But we know that it's a it's a rare gem. You know, it's a community based market. It's a grassroots effort, and a lot of good happens for people that come to the market, and a lot of hope. We have. Um, you know, some other vendors that sell jelly and, uh, hey, I do jelly. So we give a lot of other folks entrepreneur ideas and we work with a lot of young people. And at one time we had the Juice Girls. They, they're they all in college now. But when five years ago they were in high school and middle school, they were doing juice. 
and young people would come in the market and one young girl came up. She says, I've got this idea. So if I can get it done, can I sell my stuff here? And I said, absolutely. You know, so, um, you know, it's, it's great work. And, and ideally we'd be selling out every week, but the reality is that there's a lot of, for us, we feel like there's a lot of education that we still have to bring to people in our community about On the, the shopper side. Yeah. On the yeah. shopper side, like you got to be here. This, this is your food. Um, we're still getting people, some people to sort of, you know, drop that negative image of, you know, that relationship with land. And believe it or not, a lot of people don't really care about eating fresh food or if it's, you know, preservative free or we can't label it organic, but if it's grown without pesticides and just grown with a lot of love. So a lot of the work that we do is education. Educating the shoppers. It but, seems like it's yeah. a, it's such an unusual program that you could almost, if you marketed it right, build it into a destination kind of market, which would be bring people yes. from all over to shop, which would increase yes. the shopper count for yeah. the farmers. But do you worry then that your local community will be intimidated by being all of a sudden a, a tourist attraction of sorts? That if you, people you were know, coming we, from outside, does that make them uncomfortable? Believe it or not, we're already that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> People come, as a matter of fact, the last two years ago, the woman who was the winner of the watermelon contest was a European American woman. And she went online searching for contests. And she says, <laughs> I saw you all were having a watermelon contest, and I came. Um, people have come to us from Texas. Yeah. They shop for Black Farmers Market. And they say, Hey, I saw you on the web. Um, people have come from um, Scotland. I can't remember sure. if it was Britain. People, they do searches and they come and say, we just wanted to see. Yeah. So, I yeah, see being we, a real we, attraction. Uh, yeah, we're very thrilled that people are very excited about knowing that black farmers are there. We get a lot of people that ask, why are the prices so inexpensive? Um, the farmers, especially Mr. Scott, who I, you know, I've always said, Mr. Scott, you got to go up on your greens now. You, you ought to go up on your okra. Um, but he keeps it pretty much competitive. Ron Kelly, they price their okra pretty much the same because people, you know, many people um, are used to paying so much more for fresh food. And when they see, you know, two bunches of greens for three seventy five or two dollars, two twenty five a bunch for fresh out of the ground collard greens, they're they're, you know, surprised that this farmer is underselling himself. And so they'll ask. I've heard Mr. Scott respond. He says, you know. I understand that may you may be able to pay that, but a lot of my people that come here can't pay that. So it's it's that community concern and um, accountability almost. Um, you know, now Mr. Scott again is the one that is retired, so he's got a little cushion. You know, right. mm -hmm. Jamil on the other hand has to price <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it up with the market. He sells it. You know, sometimes I'm surprised he had something for three fifty a pound, four dollars a pound. And I thought, okay, go for it. Go for it, guy. You know, uh, and he sells out. His food is just delicious. You smell it as soon as you enter the market. And so um, there, there are those concerns that, you know, in many ways people um, don't understand what we're doing. I've had folks, black folks even, to say, well, why don't you all, why are you all over here? Why don't you go up to the market over there under the bridge or why are you over here? You know, we have to explain that this is an experience that you won't get under the bridge. Uh, moreover, um, it's about a sense of community that we're trying to, like a movement, really. It's about a movement. I wrote um, an article. I'm not sure if you all seen the article on decolonizing the food system, Journal of Ag and Food uh, uh, Community Development, where I really talk about what we are doing is talking about food sovereignty, and decolonizing a food system where African-Americans and other um, people of color have been given the short end of it. It's been a negative uh, impact and a negative image for them. And what we want to do is figure out how to feed folk from the farmers on the land and community. So in many ways, this is about a decolonization of a food system, knowing history. Right. Have they... The lawsuit that you that kind of piqued your interest when you started. I know they paid uh -huh. out a fair amount of money, but then there was a lot of the USDA 
protested it. It went back in. I know that's, yeah. it's been a, a complicated thing. I know a lot of folks have been kind of left out in the cold on that. Is that mm-hmm. the last I saw they had made an appeal to Trump, which seems unlikely, but um, have you seen any <laughs> well, progress on it lately? No, no progress. And yeah. I will say that they paid out billions and I will say that the lawyers got 60 or 90 million uh, farmers because they, that's the work that they do and that's what they get. Uh, farmers, on the other hand, are still losing land. You might have one or two farmers that have gotten 50000 maybe a couple that have gotten a couple hundred thousand, but they've been so wronged. But the majority of black farmers got nothing. Moreover, the worst part about that litigation is it gives a false impression to the general public that they've had some relief, when in fact those things that they uh, went to litigation for continue to happen. I talked to farmers daily that are up against discrimination, that are up against people trying to take their land and that are taking their land. Um, and the, 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 uh, we do a body of work and part of it is connecting farmers that call us to attorneys or, or legal uh, remedies, legal systems or folks that are in the legal system that can help them uh, keep their land. And uh, it is, we don't see any progress that's happened. So, the litigation, you know, it's it's good that it got some attention, but these farmers are far from really getting any relief every day. Farmers are, I mean, all farmers now because of structural agriculture, but since about the 1920s, African-American farmers have been losing about a thousand acres a day. And so in the 1920s, African-Americans owned about 16,000, or they farmed 16, 16 million acres of land, 920,000 farmers. It's interesting that during the New Deal, it went down to 620000 because those benefits did not help the black farmers, who many were tenant farmers or sharecroppers. It went to the landowners, and they basically kicked those farmers who had been tenant farmers um, off of the land. Of course, the two world the wars had a lot to do with the two, but there, there's been a continuous— so it's about 40,000 uh, African-American farmers, now a little over 40, maybe 42,000. Uh, farming, maybe a little over 2 million acres. So the loss of land, which is how I got into it and why I got into it, because I said, somebody's got to do something. Not that I thought I could come out and be the savior of all farmers, but I I, I did feel that something draw needed attention to be done. To it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the, the work that we're doing in addition to supporting farmers right on the ground is I'm working on a documentary called Rhythms of the Land. In uh, 2012, I went into the field to interview 30 farmers, sharecroppers, and gardeners in 10 or 11 southern states. It's been so long, I forget now. It's in post-production. But hopefully, uh, in the future, you all can talk to me about the film that's being out shown in theaters or whatever. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but what I you know, found out more interesting data around what, what's happening to farmers you know, now. And so that work, again, is about documenting the history, documenting that Uh, Black farmers were on the land because, you know, possibly at some point, you know, I hope this doesn't happen, but it's a possibility that, you know, a few generations from here, there won't be any black farmers. You know, young people like, you know, going into graduate schools or trying to interview black farmers, they won't have any to interview. So and I also when I did go into the field, I interviewed the eldest farmers that I, I could find. So they were in their hundreds and 90s. And that film really is just going to be something that's going to be left for generations to come in time to see what these farmers were up against. And there's a trailer on there. It's decent enough, but, you know, I've got it still looking for funding to really tell the whole story. But what I found in these interviews, and I say uh, Rhythms of the Land, the love story, is you get all these farmers, sharecroppers, um, folks that you know, really had a lot of tragedies trying to hold their farm, but they love community. They love what they're doing. And so when I would come in from the interviews and I sort of would, you know, synthesize everything. And I said, this is a love story. It's a story about people who have probably lost some of them. I've heard stories about grandpa went into the barn with a shotgun and never came out. I mean, these are stories of people who Uh, you know, 50 years before 1920 were enslaved, didn't have their own freedom. 50 years later, they had accumulated 16 million acres, 920,000 of them. And so 
for those people that have that connection to land and know how how hard grandpa or the community fought to get 10 acres, 20 acres, and then when they get the baton, they lose it. That's a tragic, uh, that's a traumatic experience. And so, you know, the, 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 the fact that people continue to do it and continue to talk fondly about farming and as stewards and they're going out there early in the morning. I talked to some farmers in Arkansas. This one woman, she says, like, yeah, I go and I get the okra and I get to the market really early. And when the sun comes out, I'm back home. You know, she's a home <laughs> teacher. She's going to be in the she's in the story. But that's some love. You know, it's love for your people. It's love for uh, a moment in time where you felt like that was who you were. And it was an important thing to do that. And so, I, you know, I see this people who keep coming back to this love of land. I just, it's unbelievable for me. It is, is it, it is unbelievable. I had that love for my beach. I grew up in Daytona beach, as I mentioned. And when I got old enough to ride my bike, I would go to the beach every weekend. Uh, and when I got my car, I would drive every day, either before school or after school. And it was my beach. And so I, I still am very fond of, of Daytona beach. When I go, it's, it's my beach. And I guess that's, you know, uh, what these farmers have felt like. That's that's my farm. That's our our community land. And so when they're passing the farm on, it's not about how much money I can make. It's how I can hold on to the ways in which grandmother or grandfather or my father or my mother taught me life's lesson through this land. They taught me how to be a woman, how to be a man, how to be in community, how to be a Christian, how to be whomever. That relationship to land was tied to who they are as an individual, and it's totally tied to who they are in community. These people think about themselves in community. And that piece for me was was the love story that I saw. You know, it wasn't about I'm going to do this for myself. It's like my neighbors. It's the kids that come here from, you know, from the schools. It's um, my family all over the world or all over the country and these farmers have gone all over the world and they still have land. And um, and they come back to this place that they know is that that knows them. It's a part of who they are, you know, and that's not easy to find in this you know world where everything is kind of fluffy and you can you know that you, don't, you can't really sink your teeth into anything really concrete. But that identity of who you are tied to that land is is really key. And uh, it's it's you know, it's what I've seen that are people that they really that 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 really resonates with them. And I think that's what keeps me doing this work. It's not going to break the bank. I'm not going to retire as a very rich woman. <laughs> I don't know. I might. But it's not going to be <laughs> it's not going to be about uh, farming and this kind of stuff. You know, it's probably telling the story and, and maybe, you know, circulating this documentary. But the same thing about these farmers, they, they're not intending to retire as millionaires. <laughs> well, your documentary sounds amazing. Yeah. And we really hope that post-production wraps up so we can all see it. Yeah, I do, too. <laughs> I do, too. I'll keep you posted. Well, Dr. Gail, thank you so much for speaking with it's us. It's my pleasure. Yes, we'll be on. We'll keep our eyes open for your documentary. It sounds incredible. Okay. Yeah, all right. send us information because we'll we'll share it with all our friends. Yeah, we'll sure. share it out. And uh, and one sure. of these one of these years we'll be showing uh, Rhythm of the Land at uh, the yes, Intense you will. Conference, right? Yeah, we'll yes, do a viewing will. at the conference right. would be so great. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll I'm looking that. forward to meeting all of you in person at some point. Excellent. Great. Thank, yes, you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Gail. Have a good one. Bye. 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 Farmers markets are all about community, and all of us, operators, farmers, and vendors, keep learning. To learn what's happening from people just like you in various parts of the country or share what's happening in your area, we have terrific conversations and people sharing resources over in our private Facebook group, the Farmers Market Pros Community. Please find us there, answer the three qualifying questions, and join the group. You can also message us on Instagram at Farmers Market Pros or send us an email at connect at farmersmarketpros.com. Thanks so much for listening to Tent Talk. Please leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you access your podcasts and tell us and others how you're enjoying Tent Talk. If you're listening on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss our next episode. Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market podcast, is proudly produced by Farmer's Market Pros, where passion meets profit. 
Today's episode was recorded and edited by Justine Marzoni Mead. Original music by David Mead. Thank you so much for listening today, and we'll have another great episode next week. Tune in.